Okay, well, I think I actually have more people here than we did at SWAT, which is a weird thing. But um, so it's uh, really an honor and privilege to be up in front of you guys again. I demoed, I think the first time I was ever here, I came as a demonstrator, and there's some other work that I do with uh, layered recycled paper and demoed that six years ago now, I think. So, uh, and I know that a colleague of mine, Harlan Butt, uh, demoed some uh, metal spinning maybe last year or something like that. So uh, we have some different approaches, and so this hopefully won't be redundant or still be interesting for you guys. Uh, but really my goal in uh, demonstrating here tonight and like at SWAT and everything is I see a really great potential of wood turning and metal spinning coming together. And uh, I want to make that sort of as doable as possible. So I'll go over some of the ways to do this really simply and affordably without like a whole ton of tools or anything like that. Uh, so I am a, a member. They mentioned I'm, I'm a James Thurman. I'm an associate professor at UNT. I teach in the College of Visual Arts and Design. I'm a faculty member in metal, metal smithing, not spinning, metal smithing and jewelry. We do have metal spinning as part of our curriculum. Uh, and I apologize that I've not been able to make more meetings this fall, but they switched my teaching schedule around, so I'm actually skipping class right now. Uh, I t my students are glad for that because their projects do, fr do Wednesday, so they just want me to leave them alone so they can get work done. So uh, that's why I haven't been able to be more here this fall, but uh, don't plan on teaching Monday nights in the future, so I'll be here more regularly. Um, but I sort of came to a little bit of background on this is uh, since my background is in sculpture and, and metal smithing, I sort of came to wood turning the other way around. So metal spinning, if you're not familiar with it, is not a subtractive process like wood turning, where you have a block of wood and you carve into it and you're left with a pile of shavings and a thing that you made. So uh, with metal spinning, it's actually a forming process. So you start with a flat disc, and if you imagine kind of like clay on a potter's wheel, you're grabbing it and moving it around. So it's a forming process. Now, you don't want to grab spinning disks of metal with your hands, so there's some other tools there that, that work great for that. Uh, but there's, there's a little bit of trimming and everything, but for the most part, it's not a subtractive process. So that's a little bit different. Also, you have the, the wooden forms you might have noticed here. So in metal spinning vocabulary, they call these chucks. I know that they just look like rough blocks of wood that are the start of turnings, but for metal spinning, you call these chucks. And most metal spinning that's been done for several hundred years now is about production, so making the same unit over and over really quickly. And so you would form your chuck to the inside, lay the metal down exactly onto the chuck so that you could replicate your, um, your results and make exactly the same thing. Now, I don't do uh, production metal spinning, so I do just kind of one of a kind, as you can tell from a lot of the sort of samples and experiments and things like that. So, most of the spinning that I'm doing is called on air. So when the disc is just held between the chuck and the follower block, and I'm pushing it around with the spinning tools, and most of the metal is out there on air. So you don't really need much of the wood and laying it down on there. And in fact, while you're doing that, you want to be careful that you don't push it down too hard onto the wood, or else uh, you're going to make a wood and metal piece that is locked together forever. So you can pass that around. And this is what you don't want to do. Um, so in graduate school, I became really interested in making sort of tabletop vessels. And metal spinning seemed a really great way to do that. And so I was learning about it. Uh, this was at Cranbrook Academy of Art outside of Detroit. And uh, I wanted to learn more about wood turning to make my tools better for metal spinning. So I came into the wood turning world from the metal spinning world, if that kind of makes sense. And so I was really fortunate while I was in graduate school. I took a summer workshop at Aramont with John Jordan. Has anyone been to Aramont? Has anyone heard of Aramont? All right, most people have heard of it. Amazing experience, like art camp for grown-ups. I still remember the two weeks that I was there with John Jordan, just a phenomenal experience. So I probably learned as much as I needed for metal spinning in like the first two days at Aramont, and then the rest was just being able to hang out with John Jordan and do wood turning stuff with him. So what eventually happened is I realized, wow, I could combine wood turning techniques with metal spinning and make pieces that combine wood and metal. And there are a few other people out there that do that. Um, Lynn Hall does mostly spinnings and, and some other wood turners that might have some wooden parts or uh, some metal parts. And I've talked with them about how they approach it. And probably what I would recommend 
if you're interested in it, is to sort of make the metal part first, since you have more experience with the wood turning, and then fit the wood turning to that metal part. So I think that there's, certainly you can buy candle cups and inserts and things like that, but you can, um, you could certainly make other sort of custom metal parts that could fit down into spinnings or be spouts or handles or bases or things like that. So um, most of the time I would recommend making them separately and then kind of fitting them together. Although you could lock them together on purpose if you wanted. Um, so I've been, that was about uh, 20 years ago. So I've been spinning, not daily, but for about 20 years. And uh, a lot of the different samples that you'll see, I'm not demonstrating tonight. So the perforated ones that start from punched holes, that's a really loud, it's like driving really fast down a cobblestone road. So that's, it looks cool, but it's not great for demos because it just looks really bumpy and scary. And I don't want you guys to be scared of metal spinning. I want you guys to think, yeah, this is something I want to go do in my shop. So um, not so doing so much those, uh, but I am going to show a couple different techniques. So just something, it'll end up something like this, just like a nice little elegant votive holder with the holidays coming up. Maybe you could jump into this and get into it. Um, but I'll show the different kind of techniques with metal spinning that kind of are involved in that. Um, first off, I just want to go over some of the basic tools that are a little bit different. So most on the metal working side of it, most there's not a lot of metal spinners because they don't have a wood turning lathe or a metal spinning lathe. And that's a big investment in big space for a lot of metal workers that are you know, welding or hammering metal or something like that. So you guys already have the lathes. You're like 95% there. So I think there's a far better chance of wood turners getting into metal spinning than metal smiths getting into metal spinning, even though we teach it in undergrad and everything else. Um, so you have the lathe. The forms, I tend to use the interchangeable uh, hubs for faceplates to make the chucks and everything so that I can switch out different forms that I might need. But this is all pretty much standard things. I just have a, a threaded live center on the, the tailstock for the follower block. And you just need some space to work. So as I start spinning, you'll see the, the space that you need to work. But pretty much you just need the chuck and the follower block. Probably the biggest thing that's a bit different for you guys is the tool rest. So this might be the, the kind of the stumbling block there. It doesn't have to be out of steel with this um, kind of bar, and the, but you do need the upright posts. So you'll see as I get into leverage and everything that you need an upright post. So the regular tool rest that is for a, a wood turning setup isn't going to work so well. So that's the, the main adjustment there. On the tooling, I picked up most all of my tools from keeping an eye out and going to garage sales and seeing about auctions and a lot of industrial art programs that closed in high schools or colleges or something like that, kind of picking them up along the way. Um, I did, in conversations, uh, I was curious and I was trying to think of like how can I, I talked with uh, Neil who gave me some really great pointers about how to make this as useful and practical for, for you guys as possible. And so something that came up that I'd never tried was, well, does the, the, the tool have to be out of steel? So a typical spinning tool, I'll pass around one that I'm not going to use, is essentially a, um, I don't know which camera's on. We'll just go with this right here. So uh, most of it is just a form steel bar. So if you have some blacksmith friends out there, they can certainly set that up. And then in a tool handle. So you guys are all set with the tool handles. But the steel might be a stumbling block for you guys. So if it is, I was um, talking with Neil about how to make that easier. So just for fun, I wondered, like, well, could a broomstick actually do metal spinning? I have no idea. I've never heard of anyone doing that. It actually does work. <laughs> So uh, in anticipation of the SWAT demo and here tonight, I figured, well, so you have no excuse on the tools. You could actually just get a hardwood dowel, grab an old broomstick, and it'll work out fine. Um, now, I did have to make it look a little bit better than that. And so different conversations and ideas and, and having conversations after a demo and things like that. So looking at maybe a better wood than whatever kind of hickory or, or oak or whatever the broom handle was, so of course you're at SWAT and you have to buy tools, right? <laughs> so it's an excuse to buy more tools, which is always a good thing, right? So I um, got the, one of the Thompson handles where it just has the uh, set screws and you can loosen those. 
and I don't know if I have my Allen wrench, doesn't matter. And then someone suggested, well, why don't you try like an Argentinian uh, lignum vita that has a little bit of kind of oil waxiness to it and is a really hard wood. So uh, I had to make a snazzier version of the broom handle for tonight. And so once I get things kind of going and everything, I'll, I'll show you that wood works almost as good as steel and everything. So, so there's that. Um, there's lots of other tools as you get into it. Um, and, but basically, that's pretty much all you need to get into it. So a broom handle and a modified tool rest, and you're good to go along with your lathe. So what I'm going to be doing is, uh, and you might have, I don't know, sort of like gone on YouTube and seen some spinning videos and everything else. So there is a lot online with metal spinning. Most of it is geared towards production. So they're trying to make as many parts as they can as quickly as they can. And I am not like that. I, won't, I don't work that way. I won't demonstrate that way. So don't be scared by the speed of things online because they're sort of showing off and they're, they're cranking out all those parts and everything. So don't expect, unless you want to get into production, metal spinning or something like that, that you're ever going to work like that. I've, like I said, I've been doing it almost 20 years, and I don't, I don't like working that way. I like kind of working on it a little bit, looking at it. I guess how probably most of you guys work with your turnings, so starting to get the shapes and looking at it and, and taking some time judging on it, working on sort of the beauty and the one-of-a-kind one nature of the pieces. So what you need to do, so you have the metal centered. And you might have seen some videos where they like throw the disc in there and slam the tailstock into it and jam a, a wooden bar in there and while it's spinning, get it set up and, and all this like quick, fast scariness. So uh, again, I don't work that way. So what I would recommend is you have the blanks and uh, I think I would recommend starting with aluminum and all of the, not all of them, but a lot of the handouts and everything else, if you go to my website, I scanned all the PDFs and I figured that's easiest that you can just download any of the PDFs about this uh, that are up on my website. So what I would recommend is starting with aluminum. And annealing aluminum might be somewhat daunting for you if you're not used to metal and everything. So aluminum is a soft metal, but you want to soften it even more so it works really well. So just to pass that around, um, this is not annealed. And this one is, just so you can compare the two, pass those around. And it will make a difference, even though an, uh, aluminum is really soft. So what you need to do to, you can anneal it just with a basic plumber's torch or something. You don't need an expensive setup or anything. But aluminum does not change color when you heat it up to soften it. So if you're waiting for it to like glow magically red like copper or steel or something, you're going to just melt into a blob of aluminum that does not spin very well. So you want to avoid that. So you, there's two, two things that burn off at the aluminum temperature or the annealing temperature on aluminum. One of them is like Sharpie marker and the other is just soot. So if you have like an acetylene torch and you can soot the metal or if you just scribble on it with Sharpie, you can see the annealed one has these kind of scribble marks. So what I normally do is I just scribble with Sharpie on it and then heat it up with a torch until the ink burns off and then you know you have a nice soft disc to start with. Um, if Cutting discs is an issue because you're not metal workers and you're like, well, I don't even have metal snips or anything else. Uh, you can certainly order these and I can tell you different sources and things like that. So um, one thing I will warn you, uh, they make industrial strength Sharpies that have high temperature resistance. Don't buy those <laughs> and use them to anneal your aluminum. I heard that isn't end well. I don't, maybe it didn't happen to me, I don't know. but. Um, <laughs> FYI. So, so this is annealed. I have this centered between the chuck and the tailstock. And all I'm going to do while this is spinning, and I don't work at a really high rate of speed because, again, I'm not into production. I'm not cranking these out. So it's about 1,000 RPM, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, but it should be clamped well in here. And the only, so there's a couple main, I like to cover safety first, um, that you want to make sure, I'll pause. Uh, so two main things is the, even though this is not a sharp disc of metal, still it's a rotating spinning disc of metal. So while it's spinning, don't touch it. <laughs> Common sense, right? And then the other thing is that yes, spinnings can slip out and everything else. Most likely it'll just sort of like drop and roll. It won't like shoot out like 
some kung fu movie or something. Um, but really, once it's locked onto the wooden chuck right here, it's not, at worst, it might go sort of catawampus or something, but it's not going to fly off or anything. So the first thing that you want to do is lever this metal down while it's spinning to lock onto the base. So I tend to have the top part of my, my wooden chuck the, the size of the interior, so the little candle cups or something like that. Um, you also need to lubricate this while it's spinning so that you're not rubbing steel up against aluminum and kind of dragging into it and everything else. And there's all kinds of discussions about all different kinds of lubricants. And this, this engine axle grease is better than this other one. And we had conversations about making your own lubricants at SWAT and all this other kind of stuff. So since I'm not doing this every day and I don't want to like cover my shop in like axle grease and everything else, I just use a basic paste wax. So I figured that's not as obnoxious. If you get some wax on your lathe, it's not going to smear all over your clothing and your wood and things like that. However, I, it does get a little bit of grime on it. So I do have my like special spinning jacket because you know I got my like snazzy wood turning jacket that I don't want to get things on. So, so I do have a separate jacket just because you, you probably will get like a little bit of the lubricant on you and stuff. So. So just got to suit up for that. Uh, of course, with any lathe operations, I think I'm a big proponent of face shields. I know there's a whole big debate about like goggles versus face shields and all that other kind of stuff. So I, I, I really like all this staying how it is. So I use a, a face shield on that. Uh, the other thing is just because of the spinning metal and everything else, I do like to wear gloves. Honestly, I don't wear gloves as much when I'm doing wood turning, but I will with metal spinning. And I really like, so I'm not a large human being, right? I'm, you know, so uh, I l it's tough to find gloves that fit me really well. And I think loose fitting gloves can really be a hazard, particularly around spinning things. So I like really tight fitting thin gloves. So these are for TIG welding, which is uh, tungsten inert, ga inert gas welding. Uh, but they're really thin for delicate touch and everything. And they fit me really well. So big fan of those. But they, you know, there's other, whatever gloves kind of fit you really well. General kind of face shield. Oh, I'm not going to use that one, but I'll just take it out of your way. And so we're all set. You can still, it's a little bit echoey. Is that still all right? Should I like talk a little quieter? <laughs> okay, so first thing you want to do is just, I have the blank centered. I did that just to save time. And I have some uh, paste wax on. Uh, actually, I just used a bundled up used old sock, but whatever, whatever rag works for you guys. And this will center up. It's relatively close center-wise, so you just have a little bit of wax on there. And the, the tool shape that I like is generally kind of like a half spoon shape that has a little bit of round but a slight kind of point to it to get it seated down on the edge well. And then you wanna, you're constantly going to be moving your tool rest and post based on the contact point of the metal. So you're going to get in right here and a little bit of force. So again, I'm not like a big, giant, hulking guy. So sometimes I'll tuck under, use my body for leverage and everything. But I'll get it seated onto that chuck right there. And then you do want to go all the way out to the, you want to reduce the amount of force that you're using. But go out to the rim of metal and maintain that edge of metal uh, perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So what keeps this from like collapsing in, which sometimes I'll do on purpose for like sculptural reasons and things like that, but what keeps the metal from collapsing in on itself is that outer rim being whole and perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So towards the end, you can trim it back off and everything else. But you want to keep that out. So the most force I'm using is right down close to the contact point to the chuck. And then I'm kind of feathering the amount of force out as I'm moving out towards the rim. And you can, if you want to maintain the even metal thickness, you do want to sort of feather out to the end and then spin back spin into the form so that you're not spreading the metal out too thin. But that's kind of more refined. Don't worry about it. at this point. We just want to kind of shape some metal. So most force right there and then kind of easing back off pushing a little bit further, and you're constantly, just like with turning, you're going to be adjusting where your tool rest is for the job that you need to do and everything. 
And depending on the, the spinning that you're doing, the point of contact for the tool, this is a bit different from wood turning where if you're like below center while you're turning, that's really not going to go too well, right? <laughs> so in here, I tend to actually spin quite a bit below center. You can spin and have the tool contacting the metal even with the, the um, kind of the center point of rotation. I tend to, to spin under because it gives me a little bit more leverage against the, the tool post and everything. So most contact right there and then kind of feathering back off. And you may notice the metal will sort of flop back and forth a little bit. That just happens while you're working. Most floors kind of feathering back off. See, it's not so hard, right? You guys could all be doing this. You could make tons of Christmas presents before you even know it. So I'm keeping that rim perpendicular to the axis. Just kind of laying it down on there. Again, I'm kind of burnishing or pushing against the wooden check underneath, but not super hard, and I don't have any um, sort of undercuts in the wooden form here that I might trap the metal onto. So since I was thinking about something, what can I make that's interesting for a demo and everything? So I did want to show, so at a certain level, like that's it. <laughs> Which doesn't make like a super exciting demo, like, yay, it's a, it's a trivet that you put like coins in or something, I don't know. So I did want to show you a couple other techniques that don't get too advanced, but might make a sort of a more interesting sort of finished object. But you just can do more of that as far as starting at that base point, feathering it down, and then back onto it. So any basic questions? Yeah. Are turn any larger things? How big a thing do you turn? I, I generally like kind of smaller tabletop items. So, I mean, you can see uh, tons of really amazing videos. And I've visited different metal spinning shops uh, where you want to, um, I mean, thinking about these are probably pressed, I'm guessing, the, like the air, air sort of vents there. But uh, things that aren't super high production, but let's say they're making an airplane and those cowls that go around the, the engine intake, those are most likely spun. They're not going to make the dies to press those out or something. Uh, so they get quite big, yeah. And there, there's other reasons at a technical level as far as the qualities that happen to the metal while it's being spun that's very different from uh, like stamping or machining down to it or something like that. So there can be other properties there that are important. And you can spin incrementally so like if you're thinking with like a nose cone like having this be a point it's really tough to get any leverage against the metal so you would have some incremental stages where you might spin it like this and then have a, a jig that would hold it and then you can spin this back down to a point or something like that so you can you can get really sort of fancy with it I think when uh, Harlan was here I think Harlan worked with Neil on making some of those breakdown chucks so you can make chucks out of many parts so that then you could, let's say, spin most of a sphere and then break the chuck down and pull all the wooden parts out and then you have like three quarters of a sphere. That gets, I mean, you can talk to Neil about making that chuck. It's not, it's an involved thing. It's not super involved, but it's, it's a tool. Um, so everything else is making sense though as far as the basic forming, right? Yeah, another one. Sure, so that's always, it's great that you asked that question because it, that's always an issue in any sort of sheet metal work is the edge because the metal is strong but it's a relatively thin material and so even if it's not sharpened, it still feels relatively sharp and if you're thinking about housewares or something that you might be using as a bowl and things like that. So if you notice on some of the samples I have and then in other things in general, they tend to roll that edge over. So uh, if all, everything goes well, I was going to do that to show that. So uh, that's for a reason a lot of times like um, if you think of those cheap clamp lights, those are all spun, probably CNC spun, but those have the edges rolled under so that they can be really safe and everything.